this video is um, the lecture that goes with um, module number five for nanotechnology, which is about characterization techniques and how we can see things at the nanoscale. Um, as you are going through this slide deck, um, I'd like you to complete the questions that are linked here. Oopsies. Uh, complete the questions that are linked here. And you can see those questions right there. Okay. So um, as always, this slide deck was primarily uh, founded by the National Science Foundation and the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. And it is a copyright of the Pennsylvania State University. I did modify it as you'll probably be able to tell. So I'm not going to play it here, but uh, this uh, video on the world's most powerful microscope, you'll have to play in from the slide deck itself. And it does talk about the microscope and compares it to a light microscope. And there are several questions on the question sheet about both um, about this microscope that's described in this video. So please do watch it. It's about eight or nine minutes long. Once you're finished watching that video, which is based basically on a, um, SEM, scanning electron microscope, I'd like you to watch this video, which is about 11 minutes long. And this one is focusing primarily on the um, scanning tunneling microscope. And there are several questions on the question sheet for this video as well. So the outline for the rest of the video is going to cover what do we mean by seeing at the nanoscale, the electron beam based tools for producing the images using electrons and the two videos um, that were prior to this slide also cover that. The electron beam based tools for producing for producing composition information using X-ray photons, scanning probe tools, how small can we go? And then a slide on summing up the key ideas. Seeing at the nanoscale means being able to literally see size, shape, and structure, being able to determine the composition, that is the elements that are present, and also being able to determine physical and chemical properties of the tiny, tiny structures used in nanotechnology. Engineers and scientists give, give this seeing, quote unquote, which may be done with the help of electrons, ions, photons, or scanning probes, the name characterization. So when we're talking about character, characterization techniques or instruments, uh, we are talking about um, equipment instruments that can help us to be able to determine the size, shape, structure, composition, and physical and chemical properties of nano-sized, nano-scale structures and materials. One way to see things at the nanoscale is to use beams of electrons. These beams can be used to let us see size, shape, structure, and even composition. So we'll go into that a little bit. Uh, a beam of electrons interacts in many ways when it impinges or hits uh, a material. When a beam of electron hits a material or a specimen or a sample, whatever you want to call it, um, a number of responses occur. Some of the electrons may go through the specimen. So here's the original beam. If it goes through the specimen, that's called transmitted electrons. Some may bounce back and they're called backscattered electrons or auger electrons. Um, new electrons may be knocked off the atom or the specimen and come back out. Those are secondary electrons, and I misspoke before, they're also auger electrons. In addition, photons, including high energy photons or X-rays are generated by the relaxing of excited atoms um, these things also may come out x-rays, right? So uh, in the chemistry students will learn probably in this unit that we're on now in chemistry that um, electrons on an atom can become excited 
and then when it drops down to the ground state, they emit energy, and those can be emitted as high energy photons, which can give us some additional information. Each one of these responses can be exploited to see the specimen. In other words, can be used to give us information about a specimen at the nanoscale. So we're not talking like a big piece of material, we're talking about really at the nanoscale. So using transmitted electrons to see, seeing by using the transmitted electrons is called transmission electron microscopy. And the equipment is called a TEM or transmission electron microscope that we might use. Um, a special type field emission transmission electron microscopy, FETEM, is, is, is when the impinging beam of electrons is produced by quantum mechanical tunneling. But basically the main thing to remember here is if the electrons are transmitted or goes through the sample, it's called TEM. Here's a schematic of a TEM or FETEM, and I won't go into it in depth, but you can see all, where all these condensers uh, are, it uh, uses a magnetic field to condense the electron beams. Uh, size, shape, and structure can be obtained using a TEM. So this shows you um, higher and higher magnification. Uh, and then finally, this magnification on the right is uh, two nanometers is this big. So obviously the silver atoms are much smaller than two nanometers, but they're on the level that you could at least see the individual atoms. Um, another way to determine information of a sample is using the backscattered and secondary electrons. Uh, so using backscattered and secondary electrons um, for your instrument is called a scanning electron microscopy. So the first video talked about an SEM to be able to see atoms. So that is using backscattered and secondary electrons. Um, so they kind of bounce back. The field emission scanning electron microscope is FESEM. And that's when the impinging beam of electrons is produced by quantum mechanical tunneling. Same thing, but the main thing again here is to understand the difference between TEM, which is transmission going through, versus SEM, where the electrons um, bounce back, they're backscattered, or secondary electrons coming off of the specimen. And here's a schematic of the SEM. We kind of saw this in the video, the first video that we saw earlier. But again, um, lenses are basically magnetic fields. Um, yeah, this one, and you'll see it in the in future slides, has an X-ray detector on here. I think because it says, oh no, it doesn't. I take that back. It's just the X-ray photons are coming off. And then the backscattered electrons are being uh, detected in order to see the sample. So that doesn't mean anything. Here is a here is a nice picture of an SEM um, showing a carbon nanotube. So SEM images are like three dimensional images. They're, since they're backscattered. Uh, you could see that it's the topography that we're looking at, right? Okay, using X-rays to see, using X-rays to see. So seeing the elemental composition, okay, if you look at this, all these little parts, they're all just different gray, gray areas, right? There, you can't tell what material that is. You could just tell that this looks different from that and you could tell some cool things about the structure itself but not about what it's made out of. So you can use the X-rays, remember that's uh, the high energy photons that come off when the electrons that are excited from the impinging beam um, come down to the ground state. So uh, using the X-rays to see, you can tell, tell the elemental composition of a specimen. 
Okay, and that way we could actually tell what is the material. So here's how an X-ray detector instrument works. Um, first, you install the X-ray detector on your TEM or your SEM. And so when I misspoke earlier, I thought that um, I saw that the detector was installed, X-ray detector, but I was wrong. But so you'd have to install the X-ray detector onto a TEM or SEM. And then the, the electron beams, which are hitting the sample, right, um, either in the TEM or SEM, will excite those electrons on the sample and sometimes photons are produced from the specimen as a result of the electrons hitting the sample. Um, and so those electrons, uh, uh, the photons are produced when the sample's electrons are excited and then come back to the ground state, okay? And the energy absorbed and released uh, from the photons is characteristic for a specific element. In other words, if I hit a sample of silicon, right, um, and it releases photons, the energy spectrum of the photons released from silicon are going to be different from the ones that are released from, say, silver or gold or um, any other material, right? So each material has its own I guess, spectrum of energy that is uh, released when it's uh, hit with the uh, electron beam from the SEM or the TEM. And so because each element has its own characteristic um, spectrum of photons that are released, we can, cap we can detect those, that spectrum of photons and then we can determine what element we're actually hitting with the electron beam. And so if we, put the beam on one spot of the sample and we determine that it's one element, then we can move the beam over to another spot, do it again and see what kind of element that is and so on and so forth. And that way you could actually map out what elements or what materials um, are made up of, the sample is made up of. So here's an example. Just like the SEM image that we saw before, right? Everything here is gray. You could tell like topography, you could tell what's higher and lower, and you could tell that there are differences and, and uh, lines here. So there looks like there are um, boundaries and stuff like that, cracks and boundaries. But you can't tell what kind of material is in each of these sections. So what the computer does is it'll, it'll hit a particular area or, you know, individual areas, right? And determine what kind of uh, element is there. And then the computer could give element A a certain color and element B a certain color. So clearly these calcium, sodium, nickel, and carbon are not these colors, but the computer just maps out different colors. So you could exactly see what is in the sample. So over here, you have mostly nickel with a little bit of sodium. You can see the yellow specks. And this circle here is mostly calcium. And to me, it looks like there's a little bit of sodium in, embedded in here. And then the blue part here is mostly carbon, right? So um, you could tell what each region is made out of. Okay, so now we're gonna switch, uh, switch gears again and talk about um, another way to see things at the nanoscale is to use nanoscale probes. Okay, so what we've been talking about so far is using electron beams and various detectors to determine, uh, to be able to see and determine information about a nanoscale material. But you can, there's another type of uh, microscope that uses probes. These probe-based tools can be used to let us see size, shape, structure, composition, and physical properties and chemical properties. They're generally called scanning probe microscopy tools. That's the overall general name. Scanning is in their name because they go back and forth or raster across the surface to collect the image place by place. And microscopy is in their name because they allow the seeing of small things. So a scanning probe micro microscope tool, um, all use a probe with a nanoscale sized tip 
And the video we saw earlier describes at least one method to get that super, super sharp nanoscale size tip. Here's the tip, and these are individual atoms of whatever sample that they're, they're trying to see. All right, there's two main types of scanning probe tools, at least two types. One is the atomic force microscope, AFM, and this uses forces between atoms of the probe and those of the surface being scanned to create an image and can be used on any surface. The second type is called a scanning tunneling microscope, STM, and this uses the quantum mechanical tunneling current between atoms of the probe and those of the surface being scanned to create an image. These can only be used on surfaces that can conduct electrical current. So, and then the STM is the one that we saw the video about before. We haven't seen a video about the AFM before. So, um, and a third type of scanning probe tool is this nano indenter. And I was kind of excited about this because on the macro scale, they use, they, there's such a thing called a hardness test. Now I used to do it when I worked at GE um, just to tell how hard a uh, material is. And it's the same concept as this, as this, except obviously big, like macro size. But the nano indenter uses forces between atoms of the probe those teeny weeny probes, right? That are like really fine. And those of the surface to determine hardness. So a nano indenter can determine hardness, which is a physical property. Oh, this is, and the next slide is another video that I put in here that will talk again about the scanning tunneling microscope and also about the atomic force microscope. Again, the scanning tunneling microscope uses current the atomic force microscope uh, uses, um, well, it talks about um, attractive and repulsive forces between the atoms. And the other important thing about the AFM is nowadays it uses a laser beam that comes and reflects off of the cantilever. And that basically shows you uh, the surface topography of uh, a material at the nanoscale. So just a little bit more about the atomic force microscope. As noted, this type of SPM uses the force between a nanoscale probe tip and the atoms of the specimen surface to create an image of the surface showing size and shape. It's like reading braille at the nanoscale. In, in this case, tactile information is converted into an image by a computer. So here is a, a diagram of it. Here's the surface of your material, right? And you have the tip, here's the cantilever, and then the laser beam. And as the cantilever bends, the laser beam, you know, goes to a different spot. You'll see it in a different picture, I think. And then you can detect the height of the surface based on the mm, fluctuation of, of this cantilever. An AFM can be used to produce a surface up to a picture of the surface in different ways, okay? So one way is following an up and down motion of the probe as it goes over a surface. It can be used to, by a computer to create a top, top, topological image of the surface. Or, and this wasn't described in the videos at all, the lateral deflection of the probe as it goes over the surface can be used to create a friction image. The latter also gives surface friction information. And here's a schematic of, a, of an AFM. And if you watch this video, it basically shows the uh, cantilever here and it going over this surface and at, and here's the laser beam. And as the laser beam moves on this uh, detector, it will draw this you know, the size of the surface here. So you can watch that. This one's pretty short, like a minute and a half. So using an AFM, here's an image of uh, DNA materials. And as you know, DMA, DNA does not conduct, it's, you know, it's uh, organic. It doesn't really conduct electricity. So you can't 
use an uh, STM for this. You have to use the AFM to be able to see DNA. But if you cut, if you recall, the uh, diameter of a DNA strand is on the order of two nanometers. So even though the length is long, the thickness is very, very small. Um, AFM probes can be used to move nanoparticles. So you've seen the images like IBM in, spelled out in single atoms. Um, I'm not sure if they use an AFM or an STM, but uh, you know one of these types of probes in order to make that. So you can move individual atoms. Okay, now we're switching to scanning tunneling microscopes. Um, this type of SPM uses tunneling current between the tip and the atoms on a surface to create an image and even composition information. The tunneling current is fed to a computer which turns its strength into an image position by position. So dep depending on how strong the current is, it can tell you how far away the, the atoms are. Tunneling current is a quantum mechanical phenomenon which depends extremely strongly on the distance between the tip and the type of atoms on the surface. So STMs give excellent spatial resolution. Um, here's another picture of um, using STM on a silicon surface. And each of these bright spots are a silicon atom. And you can see the hexagonal structure of the smallest rings of uh, silicon atoms. Um, STM probes can also be used to move individual atoms or molecules using voltages applied between the tip and the selected atom or molecule. So how this is done is to move atoms and molecules, the STM tip is moved close enough to the surface absorbate or the atom or molecule that you're trying to, to move around. Um, close enough that the tip absorbate attraction is comparable to a surface absorbate attraction so that it's attracted to the tip as much as it's attracted to the surface. In this regime, the atom or molecule can be made to follow the tip wherever it is moved along the surface. So now since it's attracted to the tip as much as the surface, you could kind of move it along because it goes along with the tip. One can then retract the tip without causing the atom or molecule to desorb from the surface. So you move it to where you want it to, and then you carefully remove the tip and the atom or molecule will stay where you put it. Um, here, atoms on a surface are being arranged by an STM to form a corral. This is a famous picture, I think you've seen it often. I imagine that the patience required to, to do that is super, super high. Um, but yeah, they, they've made this quantum corral, like individual atoms here. All right, this is information about the nano indentation tools. Another example of a probe-based technique is nano indentation. This technique presses a nanoscale tip into a specimen surface at a specified rate and with a specified force, thereby determining hardness. This is an example of determining a physical property with a nanoscale resolution. And so I thought this slide was fascinating. So here's your tip right here, right? Oh, let's see, your tip over here, yeah. And then, um, this picture shows three different, what does it say, forces. It's scan the surface of a specimen performing indentations using a selected indentation parameters, rate and force, so the rate and force. At each indentation, a diamond cantilever tip right here is lowered and forced into the target surface, causing the cantilever to deflect. By then knowing how far the tip is able to press into the surface for the specified rate and force, the material hardness can be determined. Imaging can be done to determine location of the test. So then after you do this, you could do an image to find out where you were, you know, had the test done on a particular sample. 
So this indentations of two different diamond-like carbon films using three different forces, 20, 23, 34, and 45 micronewtons of force. And obviously I would, the highest, the biggest holes are probably the 45 newtons, micronewtons, and the smallest is the 23. So how small can we go and still see? And this slide was created in 2009. So I honestly don't know if it is still accurate, but in 2009, um, the TEM, Transmission Electron Microscope, could see down to approximately one angstrom. And it says here 10 angstroms, I thought it said here, 10 angstroms is approximately one nanometer right? So even below one nanometer. And then the SEM, which I actually used to use a million years ago, um, is in the 100, 100 angstroms or 10 nanometers to like uh, one millimeter range. It's on the bigger side. So at the time of this slideshow, a TEM could see at one angstrom. All right, final ideas. Nanoscale probes or beams of electrons, ions, or photons can be used as our means to see at the nanoscale. And as you saw from the first video, light, which is what we use for our light microscopes that we have at school, the wavelength is too big to be able to see anything at the nanoscale size. So you have to use these other beams that have wavelengths that are much, much smaller in order to see. Signals generated by the interaction of these probes or beams with a material can be computer processed into pictures we can see. These pictures can give us size, shape, structure, chemical and physical property information and composition. I think that's the end.